Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Dawson, and today we are going to talk about canine parvovirus. Now, the reason that I want to talk about canine parvovirus is that it is one of the diseases that's in our core block of canine vaccines. And when I went and did my rabies series, which you can find up here, part of the reason I did that is because I wanted to tackle why we give a bunch of these vaccines that we maybe don't always talk about in the appointments that we're, we're in, just because there's not enough time to go over all the specifics. So this video is really about what is canine parvovirus, why do we vaccinate for it, and a little bit of more in-depth things of what kinds of disease it causes, what parts of the body it attacks, and kind of what the consequence of that is. So canine parvovirus was first described over in Europe in 1976, and basically it ran rampant throughout the world. Um, lots and lots of dogs had gastroenteritis or inflammation of the bowels and stomach, as well as myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. And it was first described and found out to be canine parvovirus, and it spread throughout the known world, specifically in Europe and in America and across the United States and across uh, the rest of North America as well. Now, what we found out is that this virus is actually very similar to a virus called the feline panleukopenia virus, which is basically the feline distemper virus. Now, in cats, it can cause some issues with brain development in little kittens, as well as a bunch of other things that we'll talk about later. But basically, there were th two to three mutations that seem to have caused this virus to be able to jump from cats to dogs. And in dogs, it typically caused issues in puppies from six weeks to about 20 weeks of age. When it hit this age group of dog, we found that it had almost a 100% mortality rate, meaning almost 100% of patients that were infected with this died there really wasn't a lot that was being done to keep them alive. And we'll talk about treatment in a little while uh, because things have changed a little bit since then, but not as much as we would necessarily like. So canine parvovirus is spread through feces. So it's a fecal oral transmission. Usually dogs are going to pick it up somewhere in a crowded environment like a kennel or you know, sometimes like a puppy mill environment, as well as places like a dog park uh, are a potential as well. And the reason for this is that anywhere where a dog poops, they could be leaving parvovirus, but dogs can also start shedding this virus before they start showing severe symptoms. And so anywhere where there's dog poop, it can stay in the environment for quite a long time. Because of the structure of the virus, it seems to be a very hardy virus and can stick around for quite a while. So once a dog is infected with canine parvovirus, the virus is going to start infecting specific cells in the intestinal wall. Now you can see this picture here where we have what's called a villa. Now a villa is a little tiny structure that is in the intestinal wall. And this is basically providing surface area for the intestine to absorb nutrients. And within this, there are several different groups of cells. These down here, at the bottom are called crypt cells. They don't do a lot of transport of nutrients in water. However, what they do do is they replace all of the cells up at the top of the villa. Now, the cells at the top of the villa, as they die off naturally, they go through a cycle every several days, they basically are completely replaced. But when these crypt cells are infected, they end up exploding virus everywhere. And so it actually will kill off the majority of the crypt cells. And when the crypt cells die off, they're no longer replacing the cells on the end of the villa. And when this happens, we no longer have good transport of nutrients. And it's basically called malabsorptive diarrhea. And basically what that means is that the nutrients aren't able to cross appropriately because there's no longer the appropriate structures there in order to force them to cross. One of the other things that the parvovirus will cause is basically suppression of white blood cells and, or bone marrow suppression. White blood cells, red blood cells are all created in the bone marrow and those tend to be rapidly reproducing cells and this virus loves rapidly reproducing cells to reproduce itself in and kill off. 
And so we basically get a shortage of white blood cells within the body. And when this happens, a dog is much, much more susceptible to bacterial infections. And as you can imagine, this is a very, very bad combination because not only do we have a intestinal wall that has no integrity left, we now have no white blood cells to protect the body from the bacteria that's going to be crossing that intestinal wall and that intestinal lining. So we have a very bad combination that can be extremely lethal and extremely deadly. Not only are dogs becoming extremely dehydrated because all of the water that they're ingesting is going right back out to the other end, but bacteria that are naturally in the gut are going to be crossing into the bloodstream and crossing into soft tissues, causing infections. When a dog gets an infection like this, often their lifespan after infection starts is only a matter of a day or two. This is a very quickly moving infection and it can cause such severe disease so quickly that sometimes puppies will die before you maybe even realize that something was wrong. So how do we test for this? How do we diagnose this? Well, the most common test is a parvo snap test. At least in our clinic, that's what we typically use. There are other testing methodologies, but all of them go on the principle of finding the virus. And basically we're finding the virus and attaching it to some things. The test looks like this. I won't bore you with specifics. Basically, it'll be a fecal sample that goes into this test and it either is negative or positive. So what about treatment? With such a lethal disease, why even bother with treatment? Well, we found out that with proper supportive care, we can take a survival rate of nearly zero and up that to 70 to 90%, depending on which study you read. But either way, it's a drastic reduction in how many puppies and how many dogs are going to die from this disease. However, one thing to keep in mind is that treatment can be very expensive because we're doing supportive care. We're replacing fluids rapidly as they lose them. They have to be quarantined because any other dogs in the clinic that are exposed to it could get this very deadly virus. And typically they're going to be hospitalized for a week or even longer sometimes. And unfortunately, this price just adds up very quickly. And so a lot of people are unable to really afford treatment for their puppies that get parvovirus, which is always really sad. And if you came to this video and you are one of those people who can't afford to go have your dog treated for parvo, I really have not a lot of good news for you because the cold hard truth is that anything you do at home is not going to be nearly as beneficial as IV fluids going directly into the vein. Even mild cases, you really need to instill fluids underneath the skin of the dog in order for them to absorb it quickly enough for it to keep up with the loss through the intestinal tract. Anytime you put water into their mouth or oral fluids, it's just gonna go right through them. And I'm not saying that there is no hope, but their chances of survival are significantly higher under the care of a veterinarian. And other therapies that might be indicated would be antibiotics. And usually these aren't gonna be oral, usually these are going to be IV antibiotics because we need to get them into the body. Uh, with no white blood cells to protect against bacterial infections, having antibiotics on board really helps increase the survival rate. Uh, depending on how the dog looks and a whole bunch of other factors that your veterinarian would have to go through to determine if antibiotics are indicated or not. So as you know, there's already a parvo vaccine and this is fantastic news because with the parvo vaccine, especially once it's on board and the proper vaccine series has been completed, their risk of developing parvo disease is almost nothing. And once a dog gets the parvo vaccine, they typically have they at least have several years of immunity. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the vaccine is not necessarily going to protect the youngest puppies. And basically this is because of an interference with the vaccine by maternal antibody. Maternal antibody is the protective antibodies that cross the placenta from the mother and basically protect the puppy until their immune system is able to be mature enough to start developing immunity on their own. But as maternal antibody wanes and before the vaccines are able to kick in, that is going to be 
an area where there's a very high risk, uh, or if they're exposed, they have a high risk of developing disease. And that's part of why our puppy series is kind of as extended as it is in veterinary medicine. So we typically are going to re recommend a distemper combo, which has the parvo vaccine in it, from six weeks until 16 weeks, uh, at least every three weeks to potentially even down to two weeks, depending on the veterinarian who's recommending this. So the vaccine is very good. But one of the other things to remember is that when your puppy is this young, the best thing you can do while they're still getting their vaccine series is basically to keep them away from any other dogs, especially younger dogs and in areas where there's a very high dog population. So trying to keep them out of doggy daycare, keep them out of kennels, keep them out of any shelters, you know, things like that are a lot higher risk as well as dog parks. And I would not even recommend letting your puppy play with other puppies from a different litter until they're at least 16 weeks and have had three, two to three Parbo vaccines already. What you guys came here for is basically to know what is Parbo. Parbo is a very bad disease that causes severe GI signs. And we have a great vaccine for it. The Parbo vaccine, which is typically in a distemper combo vaccine, is a very, very good vaccine, and it really helps decrease the amount of parvo that there once was. Well, this was going through dog populations, killing hundreds and thousands of dogs across the world. It really was a menace. But now that we have a vaccine, the incidence or how often this disease is seen has been dramatically reduced, uh, except for places like puppy mills um, or in very, very low income places where vaccines just are not given to our dogs. So what you guys can do is give vaccines and protect your little puppies, especially when they're young. As they get older, they become more resistant to these type of infections and tend to have a better immune system. Their immune system is prepared for this and is able to handle it typically a lot better. So hopefully this answered all your questions about canine parvovirus. If it did, make sure you guys leave a like and comment below. If it didn't, make sure you let me know down in the comments what questions I didn't answer and I will try to make a response to that and hopefully answer anything else that you guys have. But hopefully you guys find these videos interesting. Have a great rest of your day.